there once again, welcome to another Lemon Amiga Play Guide and Review. This time we'll be checking out Lords of the Realm AGA. This was developed and published by Impressions in 1994. The main concept behind this game was David Lester, the founder of Impressions. You can see design Chris Foster, production Chris Foster, and impressions were based in London and so you can see the credits available on the introduction sequence and a very nicely drawn scroll as well. Through that introduction we get to a picture, you can see this is the AGA version and it says greetings player one and I think that might change if you have a saved game in progress, not quite sure but it says you can start a new quest or you can load up a saved game from here. Let's start up a brand new quest, this is the very first time I've seen or played this game, well not the first time I've seen it because I've actually watched some long play footage before we start. So let's change the economy up, you can change that to expert or easy and it's up to you if you want to play the easy game or the hard game, let's set maybe an easy level of economy for this and you can set the battle as well, you can easy, medium or hard, let's select maybe a normal level of warfare so the game is balanced and you can see full visibility or we can have a fog of war, let's have full visibility with this and then we can see all our enemies, how many human players, one, and then we get to change our name to whatever we like and we also get to choose our starting faction as well, in this game every faction will start in a predefined order which is predefined at the start at random of every single game and in this game the Earl goes first, then the Bishop, then the Countess, then the Knight and then the Baron and then us. So that means that we'll have to wait usually for the computer player to move first but in this case it looks like we are moving first and you can see the flags denote all of the people, all of the factions that we get in this particular game and I think we are the red guys so we start off you can see with a red flag and you can see that it's nice and big that's where we start that's I believe in Suffolk here we are and that's I believe where some of the Saxons landed as well and the Angles particularly moved into Mercia and so you can see at the bottom of the screen we have lots of unlabeled buttons and so by clicking on those we can restart the game, quit back to DOS, check out the options and load and save as well and it's a good idea to be very familiar with what all of these do. This is the taxation system and this is the screen that you'll only visit once in the game and I'm just going to reduce that to 15 and leave everything else on standard. This is the seasonal tax rate and I'm just going to lower that just to keep everybody happy and that's what I usually do when I'm conquering these games. So what can you see a general overview of things, you won't really need to visit any of these screens during the game itself, so we're going to show you those at the beginning, and there are no foragers stealing any food from our lands, so that's okay, we don't have any castles either, and we can look at castles in a different county, even though we haven't got any, and we can end our turn with that button as well. The main thing we can do is click on our county and from here we can find out what state it's in, what the weather's like, what people have to eat, which is the most important screen in the entire game. You can see we're in spring 1268 at the moment during the reign of King Henry III and from here we can check out the fields which the main place in Suffolk and in Suffolk we can choose what there is available for those guys to live on and in this case we can move around the cattle if we've got cattle, we can move around the sheep as well if we've bought sheep and we can also plant some crops as well if we have those planted. It's spring at the moment and spring I think is the time to plant crops and it starts us off I think with 36 already planted. 
and then the next step is to put in the number of people that we want in order to look after those lands. You can see if we put enough herders in to look after those cattle, we'll get one for free. And if we don't put enough shepherds in, we'll lose it. And so serfs look after the land, the farmers look after the seeds, and the herders look after the cattle. So you can see extra things that we can do. We're not going to look at those at the moment. And you can see our income as well. We can't afford to buy anything. But this is where we buy extra swords and extra troops and things like that. And the population screen, we really don't need to worry about that. That just tells us what the population is over a long period of time. And there are tons of stats as you expect in a game such as this. Checking out the main screen, what are they eating at the moment? Well, they're actually eating mostly grain at the moment. And let's reduce the cattle and the sheep so that they have to eat grain. They've got tons of it in. And during the next turn, it will go down to 116 grain, which is fine. And so the dairy produces 170 and we've got 224 population. So that means that most people will get to be fed on the dairy. And that means that if we can increase our cows, all the better. Here's a message from the bishop. Turbulent times, Dan. Remember that the church should be well compensated at every step, otherwise we'll get angry and we'll send troops in. I'm not too worried about that. We've just skipped on to our next turn. What can we do? Well, we can look after the one place that we hold at the moment and we can look after those fields. And so let's check it out. It will tell us at the very bottom if there are any people, any peasants lying idle and peasants who aren't given a job are called peasants. And if they have a job, they're called serfs. And the serfs will look after the fields and there are fallow fields that we need to take care of. So if we employ enough serfs into the fields, they will actually fix them enough for us to plant crops on them. And if there is a trader in town, we can also buy from the trader and sell to the trader as well. We've got 30 bales of wool, whatever it said. So that means we can sell those and we get 24 coins per item. So that means that we can get some income from the wool if we have sheep. So at this point, I'm going to buy myself some more cattle. And that means that the dairy from those cattle will keep the villagers alive without them having to go into the grain rations. You can see mostly everybody's being fed because the dairy produces enough for 330 people. We have 257 in there. So we can also double and triple and quarter and have no rations whatsoever. And that will definitely come in handy later on in the game. But now everybody's consuming dairy products. We have way enough. That means the grain will last until the harvest. The sheep will last. We're not eating any of those. The cattle will last. We're not eating any of those. And that means next year we'll get some more wool. And if you double the rations, that will increase the population even more. So at this stage, we don't really want them too happy enough to increase the population more. What we want to do is to spread those cows out and then they double even more. Let's reduce the serfs so that we get a free cow with the next turn. That means that we get one for free. It's been born and all we need to do is to look after them. And that now increases to two cows that we get for free on the next turn. And as long as nothing else is in red, that's the fields taken care of. And Swedish swordsmen are available to buy. Unfortunately, we don't have enough cash at the moment to raise an army. And this game is going for the long haul. It starts off quite slowly. But as you will see, this is played in real time as I played it for the very first time. So you're going to be working it out with me as we play through the game. And so we're now on to the third turn. And we're not going to get to complete it, but almost. Well, I never actually completed this game, but almost. I didn't bother to take the very final castle. So what do we have? It's now autumn, so we now have harvest to worry about. We know it's autumn because it has a nice red border around the screen. So what we need to do is to put enough people of the serfs and the people lying around into the farmers so that we have enough to reap enough 
of those harvests. So we need 31 and we've got 46 in. And if we play our cards right, we can get three free cattle as well. And then the rest I like to put into serfs so they take care of the land. And again, a quick look around, we can see that we haven't got much cash in. It's autumn 1268, the people are happy, they've got way enough food to, well, dairy products to feed them. They're healthy, the happiness is going up, everybody's on normal rations. So let's move on, skip a turn. We're now into winter, and that will mean the border at the bottom of the screen and on our main screen will change to blue. What's happening? There's a baby boom going on and storms have damaged the crops. Well, that's not too bad in winter because we've already pulled in the harvest. We've got enough grain. I think it said 139 grain and we've got 23 in there. That's a fallow field. So we can't plant anymore until the spring, I don't think, but let's plant some more grain fields anyway. It says grain zero in there, which means it's an empty field and it's ready for us to plant grain in. The sheep are away from that and the cows are away from that. And the farmers, it's saying we need 600 in there. At maximum, if we want to plant all those fields up, we've got 139 grain to plant. So the maximum that we can plant is 139. So what I'm actually going to do is take some serfs away. Not enough that it goes to red, otherwise we'll get another fallow field. And we're also going to take out as many herders as possible and as many shepherds as possible. And three, that's pretty good. And then we'll put everything else into the farmers so that we can plant all the grain that we can. We're not going to be planting anything in the winter, but that saves us a job doing that in the spring. So traders, there are 12 merchants around, but none of them are in our particular village at the moment. They go around and there'll be a little hut inside the main town if there are things to buy from there. We've only got one territory at the moment, so all we can do is skip a turn. Your rule of the lands is, well, peasants have gone up and size has gone up and everything's gone up apparently and you can see a general breakdown of that at the end of each year you can click on these which will raise or lower the flags we haven't got any castles we haven't got much cash we haven't got much land much of a muchness we haven't got many armies we haven't got many people and happiness is virtually the top of that particular screen so now we can see the enemies you can see the huts on the big map shows where the shops are and yet again we don't have a shop and we can't afford it either so everybody moves a turn at this stage and it's now spring grain from abroad we get some more grain that means the grain goes up to 222 we've got 74 and 74 which gives us 148 grain in total which has hopefully been planted and now that that's planted we can reduce the farmers and we can give ourselves some more cattle and the shepherds are fine as long as that's over the limit and we're still trying to rejuvenate some fields so i want to put as many serfs in there as possible still no shop and still not enough cash to buy from we're gonna have to wait a few seasons before we get some wool you can see there are different types of things that are available to buy in this case moorish archers moorish archers more more moorish archers but we can't afford them unfortunately at this stage of the game so everybody's happy everybody's very happy in fact and people are eating grain there's so much of it so no problem well we've actually got 407 population that's why they've started eating that grain so i'm going to be fast forwarding through this footage and hopefully going to get past the first county that we're looking at Suffolk it's winter again and so putting everything to farmers ready for next spring and the planting season we want as many crops as possible so this place can boom and that gives us tons of people that we can put into that army we also want some more cattle at this point because that saves us buying any the population is being raised so quickly that we can't buy enough cattle to feed them on dairy. So if we can get the cattle, so much the better. And again, everybody seems happy. 
on the chart at the end of the month, which is always good. But you can see the purple player has got quite so much more armies than the rest of us. So that means the purple player is on the march, the Countess. And that starts at the bottom. And I think that's kind of a religious group. I'm not quite sure, but we have a king and I think a knight and a noble and a baron and a countess in this game. And so have we got any more traders? Well, what I'm waiting for, Irish Spearman isn't quite what I want, but I'm going to buy it anyway. Irish Spearman, we can afford to buy up to 400 of them. So it doesn't tell me how much cash I've got but upkeep is 30 per turn so you're gonna have to be able to afford that 300 so i've just spent a fortune on doing that so population has gone up to 611 which is amazing that's going up the fields are planted which is more than enough we've got enough cattle in there so it looks like finally we're getting on top of this situation concept for this game was created by David Lester who was the founder of Impressions and he also worked on Detroit in 1994 and also hired Seas Trader in 1995 and the code was Simon Bradbury and he started with Merchant Colony for Impressions in 1991 that was kind of a civilization game and from there he also quoted Caesar that we looked at in 1992 and even Ancient Games which unfortunately we've also looked at during our Roman Holiday Special and that was released in 1991. From time to time it's a good idea to look over the map and just to check out our opponents, we've got our first skirmish army, if you remember we bought them with our hard cash. And we can also send some peasants into the army at any point, which are local peasants. We had 600 guys, so we can certainly split those off if we like. And so let's combine the peasants and the mercenaries that we've just bought to make one huge army and hopefully you can click on them to make them move but they can only move so far during one turn and i think if you combine armies that automatically ends that progress that we can do but by clicking on the knight and then clicking on which knight we want and then clicking on that destination we can move them and when we move into another territory it says we'll have to pay a fine if we don't want to be attacked well that's not too bad at this point because we've got a huge combined army so unless you bump into an army then nothing will stop us from taking over the main town you can see that this town has got 248 planted we've got 372 farmers looking after that so once again we just have to make sure that nothing dies and there are enough serfs to look after the land and there are enough people to get all of that grain so if we've got a surplus of people serfs we can put them into the army by visiting the army page we can simply do that and if we've got a surplus of grain we can ferry that between our counties so that if any of the counties are running out of grain we can simply send it so we can skip a turn now hopefully and that means that we should now get a flag i think on the next territory which i think was cambridge and having captured that territory it means we can look after it so it's winter time everybody's in perfect health and so in winter time sometimes you don't even need to change these numbers and really in winter time you can't really do much but look at that seven sheep that we're going to get and not that many herders i'd rather have less sheep for that free wool and get more herders because the people will consume that dairy left right and center so let's attack that county 
and hopefully they will fight 199 people of Cambridge so unless the town has people in it and this is the peasants that are in that town maybe you don't have to take the town but in this case we really do and that takes us to the battle scenario and sometimes you only have to approach the villagers with a significant army and they'll retreat and if we click on them it will mean that we can then move the army and if we click on the hourglass it means that the war begins so they will then move to wherever you've put them you can see the peasants are on the other side of a swamp so let's speed up that footage and by clicking on the icon we can change that to a top view and hopefully when these guys get into range our soldiers will automatically attack and if we attack them one at a time en masse as they approach from this swamp it should mean everything else is easy pickings and the peasants really aren't needed in this particular case if the mercenaries die then that simply means we'll need to pay them less every month and if they die completely we'll just buy some more So mercenaries in this case are definitely worth the spend early on because that means that they will live off the land as long as the land has grain upon it and if they are in enemy land they will live upon that. The lands of Cambridge sure are now yours. So that's two territories that we own and blue is now spreading out and not much going on from purple which is a good thing because we could be entirely surrounded by now but just like most of the war games that we've seen in this series it's paramount to rampage early and even though we're playing this in medium mode it's pretty difficult so let's check it out Cambridgeshire we've now got well, access to this place, there's loads of cows. So we're going to spread those out and then the cows will multiply. They haven't got any farmers in, they haven't got any grain whatsoever. So every time you invade somewhere, you're going to have to put up with what's wrong with it. Well, we don't have any fallow fields, so we don't need any serfs in there so what we've got we've got cows we haven't got anything to buy either so Suffolk in this case does have two three fallow fields now and you can see that if we put enough serfs in there they will recover a field we definitely need that otherwise the fields will go boggy and we'll lose everything and that's definitely a problem in this game so again let's concentrate recovering those fields and let's put everything else into the cows and let's have some more dairy products on the go hopefully by recovering that field that will pay dividends further on down the line and so you can see that we've got now some more troops we've got these troops and ones in the north which is a peasant army and at this point you really only need a peasant army to take down the peasants which are taking over the land. My liege, you've now got many countries. Do you want to see? No, we don't want a steward because stewards in this game can make a right hash of looking after the county. So even though it's long and laborious, you can make a steward look after every county for us and make it an automatic game. But even though it's boring, I definitely recommend taking over every single county and doing that manually. And then hopefully not having a steward involved means that they're not going to run out of food so the first thing you need to do as soon as you've captured the territory is move it out so let's move them out to Buckinghamshire and that means that they're going to feed off that land and they're not going to feed off our land and again let's send the peasants army into the town and let's see yes the field in an army so let's put our archers that we look looks like we've bought some archers which are a very good value indeed because they can shoot the enemy from further away. 
So let's just move those, hopefully into the middle of the map, start the clock, and they will start to move. Unlabeled buttons again means that we can check out those stats, we can shoot certain things, and by clicking on shoot and then the arm, it means that the peasants will stop and start shooting things, and when the enemy is close enough, they will start to do battle. And you can see the friendlies go down and the enemies go down, which really is important later on in the game. And you can see by speeding up this footage how we're going to get on. You can see our guys are taking a huge beating at the moment. And it looks like the enemies are still overcrowding us. Luckily, this is just a mercenary army. But if we lose this battle, unfortunately, it means that by the time we return to this place, it means that, well, they will have bred more peasants and you will have to fight a bigger army. So you can see in the stats, our morale is down to 2%, I think, or maybe that's the enemy's down to 2%. And you can see the enemy are leaving the field. And our morale is down to 0%, yes, that's us, and we're down to 0 So all of our troops have been killed, and that means that that was a waste of time. Definitely, if you're going to buy a mercenary army, put those together with peasants and that means that they stand a chance. So let's now click on the hay wagon and let's click on that and by clicking on county and then clicking on where it's gonna go, we can now send supplies over. We can send grain, we can send cattle, sheep or wool. And of course, if we need to send soldiers, we can do that manually by walking them all towards that place. So you saw that that place didn't have anything in it it's somewhere that we've just taken over Bedfordshire and it was completely empty. So let's send over some food and hopefully they will have enough food to survive. And hopefully when they get enough cattle in there and when the shop is there, we'll simply buy them some more cows. In the meantime, let's attack another county. This is Buckinghamshire. And this is us, I think at the bottom, we looks like we've got two peasant armies versus one peasant army. And SP is mercenary spearmen that we've got going on. So let's sign them a direction to walk in and give them a battle formation. They'll then stop when they reach that destination. And then you can then move those towards the enemy. case we've got over 600 guys versus their 200 guys and by speeding up that footage you can see that everything happens in real time and it's fairly fun to watch that the numbers going down per band that you can see on the screen and also the morale as well so down to six five four three two one zero that means the enemy troops are all dead they fought to the last man and the enemy has been vanquished that means we now capture Buckinghamshire and we get a nice animation of that flag flying. So let's check out Buckinghamshire and they've got loads of cows, brilliant. So let's spread them out straight away. Looks like they've no food at all. So let's clear some fields straight away. We're in autumn it looks like with the red border. So it'd be reaping time. We don't have anything to reap. We haven't planted anything. And so what have we got? We've got cows, and we've got no sheep, we've got loads of cows. So what can we do? We've got 516 guys and 650 enough dairy. So they've got enough to eat. Warning, low confidence in Bedfordshire, they still haven't got enough to eat. And I can't afford to buy them anything. I can't plant anything either. So unless I can buy them something, I can't dig them out of that pit but we are sending them something and that will take a number of turns to get there and morale in this case if a country goes down we'll have to capture it all again and we'll have to capture things county by county in this game and you can see supplies are going from Suffolk to Bedfordshire and they haven't moved anywhere at the moment because we haven't ended our turn and they take a long time to get anywhere in this game and so what can we have? We can have Gascony archers, but I don't have enough funds, unfortunately. 
So it's time to skip a turn. Dan, you are on your way to a glorious future, but the struggle has only just begun. Message from the bishop. What do you want? A new hope, new found will call to get. Okay, well, people will threaten you as you're playing the game. Some people will even give you advice. But in the main, you can ignore all those threats and simply have an army. And if you have an army big enough, then that's great. And as long as you know how to play the game, of which I had to watch a walkthrough in, to understand this because it was mind blowing how to get into it. But as soon as I understood how the fields worked, then everything worked out in our favor. So you can see things are moving now, things are starting to build up. We've got a few skirmish forces going on, taking over the region. And as long as, just like the settlers, you put all your battle armies out into enemy territories and put all of your forces on the outskirts, it should mean that nobody gets in and takes you over from the inside. We can even press that button to surround the enemy and so let's surround these guys and that makes the job even easier so they died what happened well it means in warwickshire we got the victory and i didn't know a thing about the counties well mostly not a thing before i played this game and now i do so what are they eating blue that means they're eating sheep that means they're gonna run, running out of sheep and they're gonna run out of sheep on the next turn Oh, it means everybody's going to be starving. They don't have, unfortunately, a hut outside of the town gates. That means there's no shop involved. And we can buy them something in this shop and send it over in a cart. And let's sell the bales of wool every single time. That's very important that we sell that. And that means that we've got enough cash available. And the sheep are our trade items. As long as we can sell that wool, it means that we can buy some cattle and you can see that well we've nothing at the moment in this place grain cattle sheep nothing so it would be a good idea as soon as we do get a shop to buy as much as we can and we happen to have a shop here so what we're we going to buy well maybe 30 head of cattle if you want a normal size population but we can only afford 20 at the moment half that for the sheep so that's 15 sheep and sacks of grain, well, over a hundred sacks of grain, I definitely recommend. We're going to go for 50 at the moment. They're planted now. We'll have to remember to put the cows into the fields when we buy them. Otherwise, they're going to die on the next turn. We'll have to remember to put the sheep that we've just bought into a field as well. Otherwise, they'll die. And we'll also have to remember to put enough of the population in. If we've got enough of the population, into the herders and shepherds so the animals don't die on the next turn and the serfs are in red that means the fields will die on the next turn so it's a case of balancing it out and going from crisis to crisis in this game we've sorted it out but we won't get to know the outcome of all of these emergency measures uh oh people are only going to last one season they're not eating anything let's put them on well, half rations, well, we might as well put on no rations at the moment. We've got 77 grain in, and we've got 42 cattle, which is enough dairy to provide for 420 people, but the population is only 41. So you can see that we're tripling that in order to boost the population of this particular place. Hopefully that will help us. By clicking on the units it will tell us what we've got available and it's a good idea to check out and keep an eye on everything and to buy things for everybody and to make sure everybody's happy at every given opportunity and looking after field by field in this game does take some time and it's quite fun to micromanage things and you might Notice that we haven't even got to the war aspect yet, which is kind of overlooked because once you've gone through every single area, well, you might as well change this one to no rations because they haven't got anything to eat at the moment except for sheep. But 
Once you've gone through the fields aspect, then you really do feel like that you've fought through every territory and won every territory the hard way. And we're now in 1272 and King Henry III died in November 1272. And that was huge battles going on. And after that, well, he was most famous for the Simon de Montfort episode. And you can see, whilst the king is still alive, various castles. And Carisbrook Castle is now being completed. And we've now reached 1275. So this is now in the reign of Edward I. And it's saying somebody's informing us that the knight is going to move soon enough. So we'll have to send our armies into the field, of which you can see as soon as we can afford the mercenaries. That's precisely what we have done. King Henry III had wars with Simon de Montford and the Second Barons War happened in 1263 when the Barons all got together and kicked off against the King and then Simon de Montford got his own Parliament in 1265. That's supposed to be the root of all of our Parliaments today because he got two representatives together from all of the counties and he asked them to help him and so he was the first Cromwell and even though King Henry III was present during this parliament which happened at Westminster Abbey which was just outside the city gates of London this was the first commoners parliament and he basically tried to co-rule with the king. But unfortunately King's son Edward I took Simon de Montfort out and killed him at Evesham and the Battle of Evesham in 1265 and fortunately Simon de Montfort was buried in Evesham and when the king died in 1272 that means Edward I became king he was known as Edward Longshanks because he was a tall guy he was also known as the Hammer of the Scots and the Hammer of Wales as well so he got together a big army and started beating down the Scots and beating down the Welsh. He was the first of the Edwards and then we got the second of the Edwards and that leads us into the Hundred Years War. At the end of this particular month we can see that we've taken over well not half of the land but tons of the land and we're trying to divide and rule at the moment trying to get into the lands of the green guy and you can see the enemies at this point have got huge forces and if they roll two forces together you can get to see two knights on the battlefield and if it's only a small army it will only appear as one knight you can see that most of our forces are one knight so we're going to have to roll those together if we want to take out the next territory things start off pretty small and easily but you will need to be spread out and you will need to consolidate things. Remember, if we have over 600 serfs in any of these lands, we can kick out at least 200 of the peasants, make an army out of those of 400. And if we have any shops available in any of these lands, it's a good idea to buy ourselves the mercenary army. And all they will do is cost a very small amount every month. If they die, then that's no problem. So we've got 200 peasants here, and in the fields you can see that we're actually growing that grain and let's attack this county they've at least got some grain on offer and if we attack the county we can see if they're starving by the number of animals that they've got in the fields before we even attack so they've got some grain In this case we've managed to hire some CB, that's crossbowmen, so I'm going to put the peasants behind the crossbowmen and hopefully the other peasants are chasing our peasants and that means that we can take them out before they've got here. You can see the numbers are falling down and if we can reduce that to maybe 300 guys, well maybe 320 guys by the time they get here and that should hopefully mean it's easier on us. 
and crossbowmen because the trained mercenaries will fight harder, hopefully, than normal peasants. You can see they're also wearing light body armour as well. They started off with very light body armour in these particular times after the year 1200 in the 13th century they did have light body armour and they're not wearing any helmets but they also had chain mail as well. Peasants didn't really have much in this particular time, what they mostly had was pole axes. So what's a pole axe? Well if a peasant has an axe and they pull the handle out of the axe and they put a pole into it and they shorten the end of that pole and that means you've got an axe head on the end of a long pole and on the end of that long pole is a sharp spear that you can chuck into people and on the end of the axe is a point which cuts down thin armour, even thick armour pretty easily and on the end of the axe is a solid lump of metal which is good for bludgeoning people's heads in and for beating down on helmets so villages usually had an axe everybody had to chop up wood and skin animals and things like that and look after the house which was usually made from wood and things like that so everybody had an axe so sticking a pole into an axe to give you a pole axe is what most of the villages will get when you get them in this game and that's one of the weapons they'll also have pitchforks as well in real life not so sure in the game but pitchforks is a weapon to keep people at length, at lengthy range so they did have weapons like that back in the day and they couldn't really afford swords and shields but of course for the knights they did have them and they used knights on horseback because they'd been using horses in England for over a thousand years from this point so of course they were used to horses by the time you get into the 1270s. So we've now got some Middlesex, they're currently eating the grain, they haven't got much else in, so yet again we're going to have to buy them the cattle as soon as we can do that, in order to get the dairy, the dairy feeds zero at the moment, and if they chomp their way through the grain, that's not a great idea, because that means we can't plant some more next year, so it's critical to do that, and if the enemy has a castle, then you're going to have to look at ways to capture that castle. The enemy has Tintagel Castle in Middlesex according to this, even though Tintagel is in Cornwall. And once we take over a land, we can even demolish that castle. And that saves the upkeep and we'll also get the wood, the stone and everything else from demolishing that castle. You can see the basic layout of Tintagel Castle in this case, which is apparently in Middlesex and by demolishing that castle it means the enemy can't take it over again but again we get those raw materials and then we'll get to see a nice picture of the castle burning on the main picture of the map we can also build our own castles as well just like the castles game that we saw pretty rudimentary we can build a keep in the middle of it and then we can surround that by towers and then a moat and we can dig a moat and things like that. I never actually needed to build a castle in the game so the castle building aspect, even though it's vital in other games, is virtually overlooked in this one and again if you happen to take over a castle it's best to burn it down and then you don't have to take it over again but this is just to show you that there is that aspect in this game and you can build things if you want to afford that otherwise if you've got money to spend don't bother simply buy mercenaries and then take down castle siege equipment once you've got the peasants to the castle because peasants can also build castle mercenary equipment like siege towers and trebuchets and catapults ladders and that kind of thing so it's important to get peasants or at least one division of those to your destination maybe even two and let's see what we're doing at the moment we have tons of wool did that say 121 bales of wool Whatever it said, I'm definitely, yes, we're going to get rid of all of those bales of wool. That gives us a tremendous income. And you can see we can even buy grain, but it's not available at this point. There's no cattle available. We can buy some sheep. Um, we can buy some iron and some wood. And we can buy some tools as well. We can buy weapons if we want to do that. You can see represented by the image of a pole axe. And so... We can also put the, that into miners if we want metal ore. Don't forget if we want swords and shields, we're going to have to mine our own metal ore, buy it, 
And if we want to build a castle, we're going to have to hire builders. If we want stone, we're going to need quarriers and wood foresters. But rather than wasting papal, I'd rather simply buy those raw materials and buy the armaments. Yes, you can buy armourers. And as long as you have the raw materials, which you definitely need wood and metal, which we haven't got at the moment, you can tell them to build whatever you want, longbows, maces, spears, and they will get sorted out building those items. And then once those built, you then go to the battle screen and then you simply equip normal peasants with whatever you've got in your own stocks. So you can see at the moment we have got tons and tons of people lining up along those roads. Yes, they're still using Roman roads in this period. A thousand years after the Romans, that's still all we had. So that's all we've got. So what's going on here? Yet another Leicestershire, yet another county which is completely empty. No fields, no cows, no sheep, no nothing. Do we have a shop? No, we don't. Well, the first thing we need to do then is to get everybody off this land because, well, they'll starve to death. Otherwise, they need to forage in the enemy's land. That means it's no skin off our nose. Um, we can only move several characters, but you can see we can move across the countryside. We don't have to use the roads. We can use the fields if we like. And you can see looking over there, there isn't much activity in those fields, which means those counties haven't got much going on. On our side, we've got lines of sheep and cows, but the enemy hasn't. So that means that we're going to need to ferry goods in there. Let's combine armies together. That's great. It's 45 peasants and 200 Danish swordsmen. Moving on, you can see we can even employ knights. These are Avengerly knights which means I think the French Knights. They have yet again light battle armor and does more through anything. You can see we didn't really need the peasants at this point, but we're keeping the peasants in standby anyway. So it's always good to buy the Knights. And you can see not much resistance from some of these lands, basically because they're starving at this point. We now get a chance to move all our armies into battle and that's the end game coming up and it comes soon enough you just have to remember to take care of the lands and do the battling at the same time and again move all of your people off the land and then they don't chomp through all of the available grain and that's a big problem if you don't have too much grain and so it looks like we're, the red guys were attacking from the north, it looks like, because we get a random battlefield every time. Sometimes we can get marshes as well. And you can see the crossbowmen sometimes can make short work of the enemy. And if you can lead those through marshes, all the better. So we've now got nearly 400 peasants, and we're now going to hopefully attack that castle. Seize the castle, yes. So now we're going to another part of the game. As you approach Camelot, Camelot, it's only a model. Then you'll find you go into the siege mode. Siege mode, siege mode. So we now have 573 siege troops available in total. And so we can check out that castle, we can click on the arrow. And at the very top, we can see the siegers, but I'm not worried about those at the moment. Fighters, I'm not worried about those either. You need to worry about foragers because we've got food for zero men at the moment and we need food for 573 men. So you can see 573, so food for a thousand and two. Well, it looks like the castle doesn't have any food for zero men, but we have enough. So what I'm going to do is to reduce the foragers so that we've got enough food for all of our men. And then I'm going to put all of the rest into builders because from builders we can then build stuff and building is an important part of the game so we can build a ladder or we can build a siege tower we can build a small catapult huge trebuchet or a battering ram what am i going to do i'm going to buy four i think four five maybe six seven as many as you can it will going to take 400 men to buy that and we've got 500 builders six trebuchets they will only take 360 guys 
Seven is 420. I'm going to, we're going to build one ladder anyway. Let's build some catapults for the sake of this. It doesn't really matter as long as you have the trebuchets. And then in a few turns, your builders will have built all those. You have those all lined up. So now you click on this mode, which now puts all those into the battlefield. We can now reduce the builders to zero, put everybody into fighters. And then by clicking on the castle, and info shows us the castle, we can now put those down wherever we want them to go. And so let's put down the trebuchets. That's a French word, of course and put those relatively near to each other and if we put those too far away they won't get hit but they'll also be less effective so I like to place those quite near and the catapults as well you can place those quite near and the ladder you really want to place in that next to the castle walls so that we can storm that but before we storm it let's batter it round with all these trebuchets and you can see we can move those from place to place and then we can select all those and you can see that there is an attack formation button and by clicking on that and then clicking on what we want that will automatically create those red bars and we can now choose where we want to attack so we're now attacking three different walls with three different sections and if we are happy with all of that set up as it is then they will do that on the next turn. We don't have to attack it on this turn. And then on the next turn, we'll find out what's going on. The garrison inside holds firm, even though they haven't got anything. And so this month, there will be 10 attempts because we've placed everything around. And so we get to see visibly the trebuchets attacking that castle. Those will go month by month, and this being Edward the first time, it's still all very much based on castles and wooden trebuchets and things like that. With the crumbling of the last opposing stone, your forces storm Camelot. And so that's what you need to do. If you've got the peasants, you can build siege equipment. They will take down the castle just like that. You don't even have to storm it, they will eventually surrender. And then, once it's burning, click on it to demolish it, and then take over the realm, balance the economy, and then, if you have surplus peasants, put them into the army and get them out of there before they become a train on the land. In the meantime, ferry in loads of cattle, and then the dairy products will feed the rest of your citizens. You can see every single territory that we've taken over has virtually zero for people to eat at the moment. And it's winter time, so we don't have any crops coming in. And so it's the usual case of trying to balance our resources. Impression Software was established in 1989. It's a British software company established with the main office in London and founded of course by David Lester and the parent company was apparently Software Inspirations Limited. They are most famous for the Battle Sims, the Cohort games and the Napoleon battles and various Battle Sims. We've seen Caesar already and Caesar Deluxe which were great impressions games and they were sold to Sierra Online in 1995 and moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts and then from there they were ultimately closed down for good in 2004. Back to the game you can see that we are just about to knock out the guys to the north and also to the west and if you can do that simultaneously and then spread out south, it should mean that you can take over the rest of this country. And it depends where we start. If we start in the south, then we'll have to spread north. So, just like the Kingdoms of England games, which I did manage to complete, this one is very similar except for, um, well, the attacking bit is definitely in the game. 
but it also relies heavily on the field to get through it. It's good to have a few thousand crowns in the bank and we're now up to 6,000 crowns, which means if we need to buy anything, we can do. Torn by strife, the kingdom has been divided. Unable to count two separate empires, we must concentrate on our most populated region. I've no idea what that means, because there's nothing wrong with our empire. And maybe it means we're getting attacked. But all it means for us is that if we are attacked by any of the enemy, simply march our soldiers in there and then we'll get the battle scenario as usual and we can afford up to 200 mercenaries and maybe, well, as many peasants as we like. We can have a thousand peasants in there if we like. But we've got 400 in the moment. You can see the enemies are crossing the country to get to us. They're ignoring the roads, which means they move quite slowly. And you can see that we've got field troops in every single area, attacking every single area, coordinated strategically so that we can do that in one go and that means that our battlefront stretches out and that means that we're not getting counter-attacked by the enemy and one of the problems in this game even though we've put this on normal mode the long play that I saw showed the enemies on their strongest battle mode and they had the economy on the very strongest mode and they did everything manually just like me and they did played the game exactly the same as me so there isn't much of a difficulty curve on offer and the enemies don't build quickly enough at this stage they've put the economy on difficulty it just means that we'll have a harder time we'll start out with less resources less people less money and we'll get just as many people starving in all the other places and we'll get more fallow fields that we'll have to rescue and more citizens raiding us and peasants taking our food and more problems to deal with so the hard mode doesn't actually make the game any harder it just gives us more to deal with and that's not really hard mode that's just the more hassle mode so for this one I'm playing this in normal so that it's not too easy and it's not too much of a hassle and it's definitely a mature mode to play this game in but I wouldn't say it's necessarily the mode which really gives this game a hard time in fact if you know how to play it you should be able to demolish it in every mode and that's one of the criticisms which some magazines said that if you're any good with these games it's a bit too easy moving towards the end of the game now you can see all of our sheep in all of our fields, all of our cows as well munching away we've also got tons and tons of land and it helps to go through these lands in order in a certain round circle and then you don't forget to visit any of them you can see that we've got all of them here so it takes quite some time to visit every single land and make sure that the citizens are happy enough before we get a chance to move our troops into battle and so you have to make sure you to get that it's long and laborious to have to do that and bail everybody out every single time that you take over a new land that's what you have to do and so this game is kind of long and laborious and if you like the strategy kind of thing build things up slowly and slowly macro manage the whole thing then you can get great enjoyment out of the game if you expect this to be a fight em up then it certainly isn't so it does have depth of the game and despite loads of unlabeled buttons it is possible to get through it and navigate it without too much of a headache and it's more or less a point and click game and this AGA version does have some great colours and is ported over from the SVGA version of which is mostly identical on the PC so as we almost complete the game, we'll go through the scores. Amiga Joker gave this 65%, Amiga Power gave this 82%, the one gave it 84, the current Lemon Amiga score is 84, Sea Amiga gave this 87, and Amiga User International awarded this 91%, which means the average is around about 
8.3 or 8.5 out of 10. Thank you for viewing this play guide and I hope that this has introduced you to how to play the game and I hope to see you on another one sometime soon. Thank you.